hardest questions to answer with comics is a very basic one. Where do I begin? So many years of continuity and so many countless series to choose from, finding a starting point can be difficult, but that's where this series comes in. Each week I look at all the new books coming out and I pick out ongoing series starting new arcs, notable new series, and trade paperbacks and graphic novels being released, and then I finish things off with the thing I'm most excited about, my personal pick of the week. All right, let's start things off by looking at all the notable new number ones hitting shelves this Wednesday. I'm going to start the new number ones by looking at the book I'm most excited about, and that's Time Before Time. Uh, this is written by De Declan Shelby with Warrior McConville and art by Joe Palmer. And the person I know the most in that is clearly Declan Shelby. He's a veteran in the industry. He has had his fingerprint on so many things. He's done a lot of great work for Image as of late with books like Bog Bodies. He's not doing the art here, but he is doing the writing duties. And this time before time, I mean, the, the title of the, of the book kind of gives it away. It is a, a time travel story, but within that, it's also a crime story because these individuals kind of steal this time machine from, from their crime boss. So you have those two genres meshing into one. So why am I excited about why am I looking forward to this? One is a lot of, large part because of Declan Shelby and knowing he is quite the storyteller. I actually recently listened to an interview with him on 11 O'Clock Comics podcast not too long ago. I advised checking it out. And he talked a lot about this book, where it came from, and that helped me get excited about it for sure. So another reasoning I'm looking forward to it. I also really do love time travel stories when they're done well. This does say it's like Saga meets Looper, and I love the movie Looper. I think it's one of the best examples of time travel. And what I love about Looper is how it doesn't try to get lost in the machinations of all the time travelness and like trying to explain everything, unlike something like Primer, which does do that but in a very different way, but it's also a good movie. But anyways, I just like the idea of combining the crime genre with that of science fiction, and I think that could yield to a great story, especially with you know, a creative team of you know taking a veteran with up and coming or whatever you want to say talent that is not necessarily to that level but a book like this could certainly do that so i'm excited for this it's one of the new number ones from image i've been looking forward to the most over the last few months and hopefully it all works out in the end we're also getting a new book from the x-men line with x corp number one and this is going to be i think very different than any of the other x titles because it's kind of like the idea of the X-Men, their new their new status quo, but the, the business side of it, looking at Monet and Warren Worthington Angel are the main characters of this. And I don't know, that has me excited. This could be so many different things. I We never re really saw uh, an X-Men book like this. And, you know, Tina Howard is the writer of this, but of course, Jonathan Hickman is attached. And I'm just going to help but think of Jonathan Hickman's past book, like Black Monday Murders, which is very much gets into the financial industry, but very uh, in a dark and twisted science fiction way, kind of like this religion that's behind the stock market. And you wonder, will, will this at all have a similar feeling to that? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I do wonder like how far they're going to take it. They take, you know, they're stealing a, a line even from uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Wass of about, you know, businesses for closers. And, you know, if you take the X-Men world and see it through the lens of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, that could be fun. That it could at least be something you unique to the Marvel world. So that is one thing I have enjoyed about the X-Men line is that they are trying to do a number of different things. This new kind of status quo they've been able to establish for themselves have, have allowed them to ask and, and uh, approach the X-Men characters in a very different way where for the very long time, it felt like the X-Men characters were kind of spinning their wheels, kind of focusing on the same types of stories, trying to recapture the magic of the 90s, just trying to tell those stories in a, in a new way, where this is not doing that. It hasn't been since, like, Powers of X or Powers of Ten, and all, all those, uh, the House of X, all those titles that redefine this new era. And not all the books have worked. Some have, some haven't. I really enjoyed Way of X. I thought that was one of my favorite uh, new X-Men books, actually, and I think it has a lot of potential, especially if it really focuses in on the idea of how uh, being able to escape death is going to kind of men mess with the mind of the X-Men characters. And now this, again, looking at something completely different. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it works out. It could be, be dull and boring. Who knows? We shall see. But if you want to see the business side of what it is like to run your own island full of mutants, you now have a book for yourself that you can check out this Wednesday. 
We're not quite done with Future State yet, as Future State Gotham number one is also coming out this week from DC Comics. So it seems like the Future State world or universe, whatever you want to call it, is continuing and they're, and, and they're not letting it go. And this story, although it is called Gotham, seems to be focusing the most on Red Hood. This is written by Joshua Williamson. And again, he's saying he did a lot of the work in, uh, in getting the Future State created. He didn't write a lot of the individual stories, but he did, I think work a lot in designing what that world is going to look like. And now he's taking over this title, especially now he's working on Robin and seems like he'll be able to work on multiple titles now that he's not just writing Flash three times a month. One of the biggest reasons I'm looking forward to this book is the seeing the artist of Ronan Island taking on the world of future state Gotham. That that should be fun. Those are very two different worlds, but I did like the art of that book a great deal. The uh, Ronan Island was quite the nice gem of a book that Kind of, I think, got lost in the shuffle, maybe a little bit too much, but I'm glad that the artist got a little bit more uh, exposure with, with this book, and we shall see. I'm not a huge fan of this character of Red Hood. It, it, him as a character just never felt like something I could really latch onto. I do feel like there's a, a tends to be a very repetitive nature of stories focused on Red Hood. Always the idea of like what level of violence is he willing to go to, and I don't know. I felt like I get kind of tired with that after like his first story. I feel like he's one of those characters that hasn't been able to evolve beyond that that single dilemma. Maybe this, you know, taking place in Future State, probably able to do other things. I'm not sure. But if you did love Future State, you at least love that world, or you love some of the Batman titles, you're going to get a little bit more flavor of that uh, with this book. We're also getting a new Justice League book with Justice League Last Ride number one. And some notable things about this is that it's actually written by Chip Zdarsky, who I guess doesn't no longer have an exclusive with Marvel. I'm not sure how contracts work anymore, but you know, of course, you know, he's been doing a lot of work with Marvel on Daredevil and other titles. He's done some other work with DC on some of the you know, Batman, Black and White, those types of stories. But now he's getting his own Justice League book. So that, that's quite exciting. And this does seem to be, I, I guess, an Elseworld, although not necessarily an titled Elseworld, but it's taking place in the future in which kind of the Justice League has disbanded. There's some sort of tragedy that led them to disband, but now there's this Myrtle trial that's going to be happening, and Batman and Superman, Wonder Woman have to try to get back together due to this, and what type of ramifications will there be? And so I do like the fact if you're going to give a title like this to Chip Zdarsky, you're giving him a world where he can kind of do whatever he wants and he doesn't have to worry about continuity knowing this takes place in a potential future. That has me excited to things of like what they've done with Tom Taylor and how he's been able to kind of push forward the deceased universe or the Injustice universe, giving them room to kind of tell their stories without having to worry about what's happening in the other title. So if you're not reading the other Justice League book and you're worried about this, it doesn't seem like they're going to be tying together in any major way. So if you're a huge Chip Todarski fan, you like what he's been doing with Daredevil or other stories, you know that he's actually going to have a book out this month with, with DC, which is kind of insane. I feel like there should be more talk about this book. Like I didn't even realize it was a thing until I was looking ahead and seeing it was coming out. So I don't know if you wanted more Justice League, it's maybe the current Justice League book is not for you. You know, now you're going to be able to get this book, but just be warned it is taking place in the future. And I don't know, sometimes the idea of like heroes hating each other and no longer getting along, I feel like that can be done to death. But if you have the right approach with it, maybe the end product will make it worth it. Also coming out this week from DC is DC's Festival of Heroes, the Asian Superhero Celebration, number one. That is quite the title, but this is one of those, an, another installment of the Celebration series that we've seen DC do a lot. Uh, they've done these for you know, Pride Month, and they've done it for different superheroes, and this one is all focused on Asian superheroes, utilizing Asian creators as well. Greg Pak, Jing Yu Lang, Ram V are some of the creators that will be you know, doing work in this. And I gotta say, DC has done a pretty consistent job of putting these out and most of the time the majority of the stories are pretty good i haven't loved every installment in every story but more often than not i think there's more more good than bad and there is quite the level of talent here and i think what's maybe the best part of this is that a lot of the characters that are highlighted here are characters that we don't really see highlighted nearly enough in the world of, of dc and potentially with genie lang I, I hope that he gets maybe a a new superman a story in that because that was a title that i really liked that dc did unfortunately it, it got canceled because it just 
didn't get the intention it deserved, but maybe something like this, you know, we can bring that character back. I don't necessarily know what I'll be writing, but I do look at the list of talent and there's a lot to be excited there. So if you wanted to see a celebration title, this is probably again, like, you know, if you just want to get one book with a lot of different stories at the comic book store this week, this might be your best bet because, you know, it's going to be a little bit more expensive because it is a larger story uh, with a, you know, a larger issue. But, you know, if you want to see some characters that maybe you've never seen before or seen that much of with creators that have kind of really proven themselves in the industry, you're going to be able to pick this up this upcoming Tuesday because, of course, you know, it is a DC book and they are released on Tuesday. Also coming out from Aftershock Comics this week is Silver City number one. And this is a different take on the afterlife. And in the sense of, I don't necessarily think people are going to heaven per se, but going to this Silver City. But this seems like a city that might not be, you know, the, the paradise some people think it will. Uh, it focuses on a main character that's trying to investigate what exactly happened to her. How did she end up in the afterlife? What killed her? But even that investigation gets derailed where she stops a kidnapping from happening. And what she finds out is that girl might have some sort of special abilities just to make things even the more complex. So, so just even based upon the concept, there does seem to be a lot of layers to this idea. So let's see how that plays out. This is coming from the writer who did a Mary Shell and Monster Hunter from Aftershock Comics, which was a different take on the... Frankenstein Mythos, which I did really like. I did like the approach to that story. I thought it was quite good. That had art by Hayden Sherman, too, which is an artist I really do like. This is a very different artist. This is Luca Murley. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know. I apologize. But uh, looking at the, the, the comics that Luca Murley worked on, I had not had any experience with them, so I can't speak to that. But I'm always for finding a new artist that I can check out and enjoy. So there you go. So again, a book I'm a little bit apprehensive about because I don't know a lot about the creative team. I've had some experience with them, but you know, if you're looking for a different idea, a different comic, that's, you know, not a dystopian future idea or something that's out of, outside the box of current comics, you might enjoy this book. The last and number one I'm going to talk about is The House of Lost Horizons, number one. This comes from Dark Horse Comics. It's written by Joe Robinson, Mike Magnolia, and art by Lila DeLuca. And that is quite the creative team. Uh, the artist Lila DeLuca, I loved her work on the, the comic Sleepless. That was a beautiful looking book. And of course, Mike Magnolia is one of the most accomplished writers Dark Horse has ever had. And this doesn't seem to be part of any Dark Horse stories or anything like that. It's not like an offshoot of Hellboy or anything like that. It seems to be a brand new story and a brand new idea. Uh, it's about these two women that win this trip to go to this island and they go to this house. It's like, you know, a gorgeous old style house. A storm gets everyone trapped within the home and in this home there, there's this auction of occult items and things go awry and apparently there's a murder. So you have a murder investigation as well. So you have the idea of the mystical matching the kind of old school murder mystery. And there's a lot of fun that could be had there, kind of the crossing of genres, which we seem to be seeing a, a lot uh, this week. You know, Magnolia is one of the masters of that genre, the, the gothic genre. It's clearly, we've seen that with books like Hellboy. So there's a lot to be excited there. And I, I, I've been really wanting to get into a Mike Magnolia book as of late. Like I tried the Lady Baltimore series that recently came out and that just did not work for me. I felt like it was just maybe too tied to the past series. With this being a brand new thing, with it not being tied to any of their past universes, not being a spinoff, just at least from what I can tell, uh, I'm a little bit more excited. So hopefully this will, you know, if you want something that is along those lines, you'll be able to check it out this week. Now that we talked about new number ones, let's move over to ongoing series starting new arcs, starting with Fantastic Four number 32. And this begins the Bride of Doom storyline. And, you know, I, I've been actually quite enjoying Dan Slott's run on Doctor Doom. It's been a lot of fun. And with that, if you told me not too long ago they are going to have a storyline about Doctor Doom getting married, I would be really, really hesitant thinking it's a bad idea, but I'm gonna gonna trust that this will work out in the end. And I, you can kind of see it. I mean, Doom deserves love too, doesn't he? I guess it kind of makes sense, but Doom's not the only one dealing with love issues with this issue, as it also getting into Johnny Storm's love triangle with his ex-wife and his new love affair. So there seems to be a lot about the relationship drama within this Fantastic Four story, which again, I think does make sense. Any Marvel comic that has that type of 
soap opera feel a, a, a book about relationships it would be fantastic for of course you know Reed and Sue being one of the first major relationships within the Marvel Universe as it kind of got reestablished with you know, Fantastic Four number one and so on so seeing that continue m makes sense uh, and as it also promises a lot of punching so I'm, I'm guessing that will you know that that will happen and how will the Fantastic Four take on the idea of Dr. Doom getting married what that what will that be like will Reed be his best man. I don't know. That'd be kind of fun. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different ideas that take this on. I don't know. It could be a really bad gimmick that ends up kind of crashing and burning. Who knows? But if you're all interested about Dr. Doom getting married, it's all going to be starting in this issue. Also starting a new arc this week is Star Wars number 13. Although this is kind of the, the first installment of its take on the War of the Bounty Hunters storyline it'll be going throughout a number of the different star wars books it started last week with the alpha number one which was quite a good book i did like that it wasn't anything amazing but seeing steve mcniven draw the star wars universe drawing boba fett was a lot of fun it was very uh str straight to the point boba fett fighting people showing why he's a badass i'm all for that now we're getting a star wars book and seeing how it kind of will tie into that storyline as well like how they're all chasing down trying to get the Carbonite version of Han Solo. I always say like, how are they going to make this work when we kind of know how it ends, but you kind of just have to suspend this belief and enjoy the ride, I guess. So if you're a person who wants to be collecting that storyline, following that storyline, do know that next installment is out and it'll be out this week with this issue of the Star Wars. Again, if you've not been reading Star Wars and you're concerned about, will I be able to understand this or not? I'm not sure. I was able to pick up the first installment of this new event and understood it well enough. It seems to be pretty straightforward and simple. So my guess is if this issue of Star Wars is anything like that, you should be fine. Ultimately, this is all taking place between Empire and Return of the Jedi. So there's only so much they could do anyways. So I think even if you're a Star Wars novice and you should be able to uh, at least understand the, the most basic idea of what they're doing. Also starting a new arc this week, well, kind of, is Ice Cream Man number 24. And I, I say kind of because Ice Cream Man is one of those books where each issue is its own thing. So you have not read the last 23 issues, you'll be fine because each issue is its own unique story. There have been some tying threads here and there, but this does seem to be a brand new issue not tied to anything else. Looking at the idea of, of the telethon and probably in some horror-like twist. And I, I bring this up too, just because if you're looking to get into a new book, usually we go to number ones, right? Because they're the easiest thing to jump into, especially for any series. Ice Cream Man is one of those books where you can usually understand it and enjoy it, even if you've not read any of the past issues. You can kind of get what it's saying. And if you end up liking it, enjoying it, going back and pick up the past issues and trade or whatever it may be. Again, the easiest comparison like people have made is something like Twilight Zone or other horror anthology series like you know, Tales of the Crypt per se, where you have this ice cream man creature that tends to be the, the carry through with each and passing issue. Uh, I got to give credit to W. Maxwell French who's doing this as well as HaHa and the ability to tell complete stories with one issue uh, is not easy and they're still kind of pulling it off a great deal. So uh, I think there's been a lot of acclaim for the series and rightfully so. But if you wanted to check it out and do know, new issues coming out this week. Along the same lines of Ice Cream Man, we have the Silver Coin number two. And this is, again, another horror anthology series. Although a big difference between this is that we are seeing adjustments in the creative teams each issue. Although Michael Walsh, the artist, is going to be doing the art for each issue. So this is kind of a cool different experiment. We, we've seen other books where, you know, like with Ha Ha, we have W. Maxwell Prince as the person writing each issue with a different artist each time. This one, Michael Walsh, is kind of getting a combination of well-established writers. In this case, it's Kelly Thompson to, to tell a story. Last issue was Chip Zdarsky. Now we have Kelly Thompson. And Michael Walsh, I think, was the star of the last show, despite the fact that maybe the, the writer's names have more acclaim. The art to me was the best part of the last issue so maybe that'll be the same thing i actually recently in the mail got uh, michael walsh's uh kickstarter uh, sleep stories which i really liked that was quite good and the cool thing about that too is that i bring it up because you can go to his website and that sleep stories book is available so if you also are a huge fan of this silver coins storyline and this book and you want to experience more of his art more of his stories you can check out the uh, sleep stories book which is up 
on his website and uh, it's quite good. It's very different. It's not necessarily as straightforward as the silver coin story, at least the first issue. Um, this issue, who knows what it'll be like, but uh, if you're a big horror fan, you have a lot to choose from because there's been, been a plethora of really strong anthology books. And it seems like silver coin is along those lines if it can continue to be as good as the first issue was. All right, now we talked about ongoing series starting new arc. Let's move over to the world of trade paperbacks and graphic novels, starting with Dreaming Eagles, which is from the world of Aftershock Comics. Um, this is written by Garth Enos with art by Simon Colby. This is actually one of the first Aftershock comics I ever read. This came out around like their earliest days, and I'm hoping now that more people are reading Aftershock comics. We'll get more people to check this book out. Um, this is all about the Tuskegee Airmen. And you have this concurrent storyline, or I guess two different storylines of uh, where you have a, a son and, and, and a father talking to one another. And the father is then kind of explaining his days being part of the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, of course, if anyone doesn't know who they are, they were African-American fighter pilots who were within their own branch and had some of the most successful missions in all of World War II. Uh, and this focuses on those soldiers. And Garthian is just like the, the, the lone writer that exists today that does stories like this. He, not just this story, he had Sarah. He puts a lot of effort in kind of continuing the idea of war stories. It used to be a mainstay in comics you know, many, many eons ago. So if you are a huge history fan, you do like those types of books, and you kind of miss this, heavy, heavily advise checking it out. It still remains to me one of my favorite books that Aftershock ever put out. Coming out this week, we have Cyclopedia Exotica, and this is from the uh, author who did the book Woman's World, which was actually an Instagram comic that was put into a comic book format, and I really did like that book. It was a kind of a take on a future where women ruled the world and what would happen, and now we're getting another book called Cyclopedia Exotica, and this focuses on Cyclop characters, and they live in a world where they have, you know, they're basically treated like immigrants, and they are dealing with a lot of microaggressions. There's a lot of people that have xenophobic views against them because they look different and those worries that come with it. But they're trying to continue their lives despite the fact that many people you know, look down upon them because they're coming from the outside. Clearly, you know, the allegory there is, is pretty obvious. Again, this was a book that was an Instagram comic that is now being put, put together in a complete format. And some people might look down upon that saying, like, why, why pay for money for a book that was free on Instagram, but as I can say, as a person that did really like Woman's World, it is great just seeing it all come together and seeing how you can enjoy comics in different formats and seeing how digital comics can adjust and just be as effective, you know, reading the book itself. And I personally cannot really enjoy reading books and comics through Instagram. I love digital comics, but that, that format doesn't seem to really hit me. But when I can sit down and read the entire thing, I get the opportunity to do so and I end up really enjoying it. But if you wanted to maybe see if this would be something that you would like, you could actually, you know, check it out on Instagram, maybe get a little bit of an idea of what it looks like. And if it, you know, strikes your fancy enough, check out the book that's coming out this week. Tim Gold is releasing a new book this week called The Department of Mind Bending Theories. And as a cartoonist, he tends to look at different professions and write cartoons or, or uh different takes upon them in a comedic sense. This book looking at the idea of scientists and researchers, things of that nature, and it tends to be kind of comedic and funny. I've read a little bit of his books in the past, and there certainly is a sense of humor there. It's like taking cartoons you would maybe see in something like New Yorker and putting it throughout an entire comic book. It's not necessarily one strong narrative throughout one continuous story, but diff different kind of uh, vignettes and things of that nature that kind of all fit together in one unit, again, showing just the variety that the comic book medium has. Uh, again, one of those books where you can kind of pick it up and almost turn to any page and find something that's funny or humorous or you know, something enjoyable. You make it, you know, if you wouldn't ruin the book, take it out and throw it on the fridge and laugh about it later. So if you like those types of books, if you like those quick reads that could be a nice little palate cleanser or something like that, or just seeing the format of the comic book medium adjust and approach differently through different creators, or if you're a big fan of his past work, he has a new book coming out this week. This might not be a comic book that fits everyone's sensibility, but if you do enjoy that type of style, uh, or you want something that's just a little bit different or step your toes into something that is beyond the norm, you know, maybe you're getting bored with the mundane style of what you're getting weekly with most comics, 
this will be something that's very different than anything else that comes out this week. The last graphic novel I'm going to talk about this week is Stone Fruit by Lee Lei. The story is about Bron and Wei, who are a queer couple that enjoy the role of being, being the weirdo aunties to their six-year-old niece. And this seems to be focusing on that relationship, but also kind of the uh, discontent that they have had towards their other members of their families who maybe don't approve of their lifestyle and the choices that they've made. So they've become discontent throughout the years. But as things are changing in their lives, they're trying to kind of turn things around and maybe rekindle that relationship they had with, with their past family members and the challenges and the difficulties that that ensues. Focusing on love life and everything in between. So if you like stories that focus on people, focus on relationships, focus on life stories rather than anything that is along the lines of superheroes or anything of that nature, just people being people, this is the story that you'd want to check out coming from Fanographic Books, uh, dealing, utilizing like things like blue watercolors of a big aspect of the, the art approach in this. So that should look great. The preview pages do look phenomenal as well. So, you know, Fantagraphics is a pretty well established comic book publisher. I mean, not everything they're going to put out is going to work with everyone, uh, but I think they tend to put out a lot of stories, a lot of types of comics that most other publishers want it because maybe this is not going to garner the same type of uh, sales, something like a X-Men would, but maybe they're telling stories that are much more important or at least not being here nearly enough. So if you want to read something different, if you want to give a chance, a, a different book out there, I think one of the books that I'm most looking forward to this week, this is definitely one I am. Again, this is from a creator that I don't know much about. I've not I saw her work in the past, but one thing I do love about Fantagraphics is that I've been able to discover a lot of talent by taking chances on books like this. So we'll see how it goes. All right, now we talked about ongoing series starting new arcs, notable new number ones, graphic novels, trades, all that. Let's get to the thing I'm most excited about. Let's talk about my pick of the week. So when I was picking out my pick of the week this week, it was a little bit more difficult just because nothing necessarily jumped out and said, this is the book I'm most excited about. So I thought about approaching it a little bit different for this week and thinking of if someone came to me and saying, I'm going to the comic book store this week and I have one comic I can pick up. That's it. The, the thing I'm going to enjoy the most, the book you think is going to be the best read of the week. So with that mindset, I decided to go with Barbarian Red Planet trade paperback, which collects the entire series, which just finished up not too long ago. And yes, this is part of the Black Hammer universe. Of course, you know, it is co-written by Jeff Lemire, but also has Tate Bombrell's a writer with art by uh, Gabrielle Hernandez-Walta. And I just think that this might be the best thing outside of the main series that Black Hammer has ever pushed put out. And I think part of it is due to the the uh, the the real life stories that is linked to because much of this is looking at like the AIDS crisis of the 1980s and how um, uh, people in the LGBTQ community were ostracized during that time um, b because of that crisis. Gabriel Hernandez Walter, like his art has always been good, but I think he's been doing some of the, his career stuff within this and also with um, Colors by Jody Belair. He utilizes like the nine panel grid a lot, which I don't necessarily see all the time with his work, but here I thought the way it timed the theme was very powerful. Like there's um, some pages where you see this continuing use of hands as motif of hands to, to show kind of a connection, to show power, to show anger. And then the colors of the, of the rainbow flying to help highlight that as well. To me, it was just storytelling, utilizing that medium outside of just trying to use it to set up pacing or something like that. I, the nine panel grid can be somewhat of a gimmick or overused at, at times, but I thought in this case, it really, really made a lot of sense. And it wasn't used in every page, but when it was, it was done really well. And I just found it to be one of the most emotionally strong books that was ever put out through the Black Hammer universe. The Dr. Tomorrow book that came out was also quite good. It had some family dynamic, which I thought was quite strong, but I thought this went beyond that because I think Barbellion as a character is quite unique. Yes, you can kind of tie him to something like Martian Manhunter. You know, he's inspired by that character, but I thought this brought it into an entirely different level. I was just really impressed with this from, from top to bottom. When it came out each week, it tended to be my favorite book of the week nearly every time. So even if you've not read another Black Hammer book, you can pick this up and really enjoy it and really like it. Uh, hopefully like it, you know, as, as I'm, I'm heaping a lot of praise about it. Uh, but if you're ever interested in kind of 
getting into the Black Hammer book, this is a good one to do. And I think it also strengthens the other Black Hammer books that came out before because you more about the character of Barbellion that, you know, he was a part of the other books, but I think this, with him being the focus, you just realize how strong of a character he really is. All right, well, that's it for me for this week. I do appreciate you taking the time to check out my channel and watch this video. So let me know what you're excited about this week coming out uh, in the comment section below. But just remember that comics are for everyone. The key is finding the right one. Until next time, keep reading.